It's 12 noon. As you all know, if you're regulars with the Institute of Health and Social Care Management, we are sticklers for timekeeping. So it's my absolute privilege and pleasure to introduce you all to our uh, Training, Development and Learning Festival, which is ongoing throughout the whole of today. But this one is a real box office because at 12 noon today, as you now know, we're going to be interviewing various of the people who contributed to the absolutely fantastic people plan for social care that was launched at the uh, Palace of Westminster back in uh, early, early March, I think. Uh, we're really looking at where do we go from here as much as anything else and trying to figure out, all right, what will version two look like and such like. I'm delighted that we have so many uh, uh, great people who contributed to that first report here with us today. Uh, and I'm going to hand on perhaps to Adam to just kind of scene set, if that would be OK. Thank you, Adam. Well, thank you so much, John. Um, so I have been saying that I've just come from our, um, our uh, session on sign language. So I'm going to commit to the, the vision that actually we need to learn and be trained and do better. So... So hello, I am uh, Adam Pennell, Director of Social Care. I did say good morning because I've completely forgotten what good afternoon is, so I do apologise. <laughs> but it's the effort that counts. The people plan for social care, oh, where do we start? Where do we begin? I mean, most of you who are joining us now have been on this journey with us since um, well into the end of last year. Um, this is our third round table now, I think, on the people plan discussing um, the issues that we raised within the first section. As John rightly mentioned, we are heading in towards our second people plan, which we are looking to publish at the end of November this year. And the consultation is now live for that. And I'll pop the link for the, the consultation page um, into the chat box here. We do have our standard survey consultation for the people plan, um, but we have tried to make it as accessible as possible this time round. So uh, on our web Page. There are multiple different avenues in which you can submit your information um, and I am working with the fabulous Caroline Green to try and uh, get an easy read version out there as well. We do want it to be um, as accessible as possible. Since the last time we met, we've had the Health Plus Care Show. And it was apps. I mean, it was packed. Most of you uh, in this room were, were with us or joined us on the panel or have heard about it. And we were so lucky to be able to have two uh, panel discussions around the people plan. One on the health stage. Um, so it was our first sort of foray into integration, health and social care for the people plan. Um, and then we got to close off the rest of our, our two days on the keynote stage um, in the care theatre. Um, and the response we had for the people plan while we were there was incredible. Everyone was saying that it's different to what they've heard before, but the passion about the people, or the passion from the people involved in it is what resonated the most. And that's what's exciting about this is it is the people who are creating this for the people that isn't going to be the only way forward but I do believe this is possibly one of the best ways to get most people included. Um, so as we're aware, the people plan uh, that we published last year had five sections, public image, recruitment, retention and wellbeing, training and pay on conditions. Um, today, we're going to be discussing um, the training aspect of the people plan. Um, and I want to introduce everybody who we've got joining us. We've got a nice sort of uh, healthy panel with us today. So um, because my screen's all a mess, because I did a technical faux pas at the beginning, I'm going to go down my list and ask people to introduce themselves from my list. So, Sue Jones. Hi, I'm Sue Jones and I run a care consultancy called Thoughts Become Things and I help care businesses attract private clients and great employees to their business. Thank you, Sue. Uh, Mindy? Hello, I'm Mindy Sawney and I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Care Stockroom, which is focused on serving the needs of smaller care providers for products, services and advice. But I'm also a non-exec director in the NHS and I've previously chaired a small group of care homes and I'm absolutely passionate about training and development. So delighted to be here. Thank you so much, Mindy. Uh, Caroline Green. Hi, I'm Caroline Green. I'm a social care researcher at King's College London, and I research everything social care, really, including training and development of the workforce. Um, and I have a special interest in human rights and equality and digitalization. Thank you, Caroline. Calling Ali Canty. Do we have Paul Blaine available? <laughs> 
I certainly hope so. It sounds like the Eurovision that, doesn't it? Nil point. Um, yeah, so I'm Paul Blaine. I, uh, I've worked in care since I was a tender age of just turning 17. So from carer all the way up, I have um, some small care homes and uh, I'm also the managing director of a national training organisation, which is Care Business Associate Training. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Steph? Hi, I'm Steph Thompson. I'm the, I work with an organisation called My Home Life England. We're all about promoting, turn off the phone, <laughs> positive practice and improving quality of life for folk who live, work, die and visit care homes and other care settings. And we do that with a real focus on leadership, support and development, research, consultancy and I guess we'd like to say social action. Um, and in another life, I'm also trustee of a couple of small charities that work directly alongside people who are users of social care services. Thank you so much, Stephanie. If you aren't aware of what My Home Life England is or My Home Life UK is, please go check them out. They are incredible and do some absolutely fantastic work. Um, I know Caroline Green on our panel today is also involved in My Home Life. I'm a huge advocate for him. Go and have a look. Uh, and finally, Rachel. Apology for unmuting. I, I'm Rachel. I set up living for moments with, uh, to improve the quality of life in care home. I provide training, coaching, and also speaking uh, to, on a number of topics, deaf awareness, and also about managing risks. So reducing the risk of birth and senior health and social care, understanding the mental capacity act. I'm passionate about that because I believe that can really enable people to have uh, make choices that matter to them. Thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you so much for your, your session early this morning. It was absolutely incredible. And you can catch that up uh, with the box set of this festival at a later date. So I'm not going to go through the people plan section by section. We know that we looked at the current situation of training. Uh, we know we looked at what outstanding practice is, is currently going on. And the majority of that outstanding practice when it comes down to government practice is obviously coming from Wales and Scotland um, with training passports and similar. England is quite lacking behind in some of those innovations and then we looked at the the recommendations that the sector have asked us to make and the people who are using care and, and, and working in care have asked us to make um to to reform and change training and make it efficient so the first thing i want to discuss with um, with you all today is is training in social care currently fit for purpose now, I know this is um, a, a big topic and I know we may ruffle some feathers with our responses and, and upset a few people, um, but I, I really want to know, is training fit for purpose? Now, Paul, you are a training provider as well as um, a care home uh, provider. Is training fit for purpose? I must apologize. Uh, I'll, I'll take the, the, the yeah, questions ahead, that were said. Yeah. I'll take over um, facilitation now, sir. So, so this is a bit where I shoot myself in the foot, which I tend to do quite a lot um, and give the broad answer of no, it's not. Um, and it hasn't been for a long, long time. Now, the reason for that is not down to the training providers because they are delivering what is set out by either CQC, Ofsted or whoever it may be that's regulating that service. The downside to it is that a lot of it is, is very much theory based um, and it goes into a, a lot of academic things that are actually not purposeful to the carer on the floor or the caregiver. And therefore, you spend three to four hours of your time teaching about law and legislation to, to a high degree and less time actually teaching how to put that into practice. Now, the problem that you've got is that the skill level it takes to work in care is enormous it's huge you know you are dealing with vulnerable people you are dealing with um complex cases you are dealing with the delivery of care and the aspects around that are, are enormous so all that happens is every time um, a new service user comes in or every time your service moves in a different direction there's more training and more training and more training added and it's a bolt-on system and you won't find that anywhere else um, in any other industry where you're just bolting on. So there needs to be a way in which you have the standard package that's developed 
and then the added on based on what the business is trying to achieve. In all training aspects of every other industry that I've looked at, the first thing you start with is what is it that we're trying to achieve? And then your training comes into play to upskill your staff to get to that level. In care, we're all doing standardized training continuously and it's annually. So you're learning for a lot of people, they're learning the alphabet year on year on year on year because they're being forced to do that instead of actually, this is my fourth year doing a moving and handling course. So I'm now working at level four. They're still working at level one. And that's the problem. So I know I've given a long winded answer there, but the answer is no, it's not fit for purpose. No, I, I agree with you on this. And it's that mandatory repetitiveness that was picked up quite um, heavily within the, the people plan consultation itself. Caroline, what learnings have we got from, from training in social care? What are you seeing um, in regards to the, the efficacy that we're, we've got at the, the current training standard? Oh, so we just finished a study actually and published the, re the report um, with where well, we interviewed around 60 home care and care home providers across London. Um, in regard of further education colleges and what they would like to see more of. And what we could, well, you know, what Paul just said, um, I think that's what, what comes out of it a lot is that everyone says, well, at the moment, we're not really getting what we need, um, something that we can fit around our staff and you know, all the time consuming things that they have to do every single day. Um, but we also see that there's a massive willingness there. There's an appetite for training, um, on, on their side, there's an appetite to work with different organizations, with training providers, but also with further education colleges and so on, um, and an appetite to have um, peer support, learning networks, um, and try out new ways of, of uh, receiving training. So um, I think this is something really positive, where we're saying, yes, at the moment, training isn't fit for purpose, but we all want to work together to do something about it and to make it fitter for purpose. And that's what I mean. I always go on my highlights and lowlights. And I think if someone's going to bring a low light to the situation, they need to bring a highlight alongside it. If we're going to bring a problem, let's bring a solution at the same time. We've got to look at things proactively. Sue, I come to you quite a lot when I talk about new models and the future of care and what the future is going to be looking like. What do we think um, around the current uh, standard of training and, and what needs to change with it? And, uh, you know, you and I, we do talk quite a bit on this and, and it's almost when I was looking at the skills for care stuff and again, you know, it's all being prescribed by the, the legislation, but the legislation seems to be working off the lowest common denominator, you know, it's always the lowest point. And you look at the mandatory training and there's, there's a tiny section on person centred care. You know, everything else is all about the, the you know, the, the training, that, the additional training that people have to go through. And you're absolutely right, Paul. The things that people have to learn and remember that's not actually relevant for the role that they're in. If you started with person-centered care and you started off with how do we actually create great client experiences, everything else falls into place. You know, that's, that's where the starting point and let business owners, you know, for me, should be giving autonomy to business owners to make that decision. I know, and I go back to financial services, they, they scrapped the regulatory rule bo book back prior to 2012, they scrapped it. And they actually bought into principles based regulation. And that gave it, you know, all the, the little bits of regulation that currently care businesses have to do now, that went to a principles based regulation. And that meant that the onus was definitely on the, the business owners. And it's all about the corporate governance, making sure they've got the right, they're well led, they've got the right leadership, they've got the values, the culture, et cetera, in place. And once you have that, everything, as I say, everything else falls into place. Talking of regulation, and you mentioned the S company, so I will bring them up, Skills for Care. I think if we're going to have a conversation around whether training is currently fit for purpose, I think we need to ask whether Skills for Care is currently fit for purpose we you know we're, we're fully aware they're heavily funded by the government um and again the training the care certificate is it useful you know people have to complete that isn't currently non-transferable i know they're looking at making it transferable 
But how do we get to a point where we we look at desirable training as the training we want to achieve? You know, I don't want to put people through safeguarding every single year. I want to be able to put them through specific behavioral training and specific dementia training. Steph, in my home life, I've worked with you in the past and, you know, we created pieces around shared decision making. Um, what what are your thoughts currently on the deficit of the, 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 the essential training that we need to be doing, not the stuff that we're doing repetitively? I think it's important to recognise there is a real role for actually having something portable that's transferable and, and that actually is uh, that doesn't have to be repeated. There's a really obvious thing to say around actually there's a time deficit to support people to really understand the training that they're doing. There's something clearly around actually thinking about frameworks that support people to recognize and really enhance the diversity of the people that we work with. Um, you know, it, it's great that um, there is a common sense of purpose around relationship-centered care, person-centeredness, but also there is something about if you're working alongside somebody who has a learning difficulty, you maybe do need something that supports you to really work with them well, which will be different to if somebody's got a brain injury. Um, and I don't think we're there yet at all. I don't think that's reflected. And going back to the regulator, I think there's a set of complex messages in there as well, because um, one of the things we really know at My Home Life is that there's something about supporting great culture for people to celebrate, to talk about mistakes, to feel safe, to learn and share that sort of almost, you know, the concept of psychological safety of an organization. So on the one hand, we're, we're really saying great cultures are about developing quality. On the other hand, the complex message from the regulator is, so lead this team so that they can do that, but at the same time, be risk averse and never own up to making mistakes. And I, there's just like one little tiny story I'd like to tell that somebody shared with, with me recently on one of our courses, which was around the fact that a person who really needed turning to, for their own skin safety, um, and all the staff had been trained on what to do. What hadn't happened was they hadn't had the discussion about the fact that for the people who were turning that lady, when they were turning her, she was in real pain. And, and because they cared about her so much, they didn't want to do it to hurt her. So they ticked the box that said, because that was, and over a period of time, of course, she ended up with a pressure sore because people hadn't been turning her. And it, and it wasn't until the, the manager of that program really sat down with the team and tried to understand what had happened. And they spent some time listening and learning together that they were able to understand there was an emotional impact of that and work together to support each other. So it was okay for her to be hurting. And I'm not sure anything in the sort of standardized systems that we've got at the moment really reflects that human beingness yeah there's definitely a lack of person-led person-centered and bespoke approaches to training i know you know when i was a provider we did everything bespoke in our little learning room and we, we did everything in-house and then the pandemic came along and we all had to resort to new hybrid ways of learning and teaching and, and understanding and it sort of set us back a number of years. Rachel, you're a provider yourself um, of training. How important is it to, to get this training model right now at this moment in time? Right. Um, yeah, I, 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 would, the, I, I agree with all the points shared earlier. The, the training at the moment is too uh, rigid in the way it's set out. So the mandatory training it has become a box, box exercise for many providers. Um, and it isn't tailored around the individuals that they're, so, that they're supporting, nor is it tailored around the staff team that they have. So, for example, if you have some staff team who are really, really experienced, they shouldn't be expected to go through all that mandatory training again. Uh, yes, maybe refresher, or maybe they can 
if they can support their colleagues by mentoring them so that we need to be more flexible how we train people um, because we all learn in different ways and at the moment I think the training package is it just uh, it's not flexible enough and it's not recognizing the differences of different settings but also more importantly listening to what people are, who have been supported um, we don't get their what they would like of their, of their staff to be trained, you know, the people supporting them, what they should be trained in. So there may be some people who are much more person centered than others, whereas others really don't have a, have a clue how to start a conversation and build those meaningful relationships. And so maybe they need to be trained in that. Um, and that can be done in a number of ways. As I say, it could be a colleague who trains them. It doesn't have to be a formal training package. And we need to look in a more holistic way of how we provide this training. Um, and also, as Paul talked about legislation earlier, we need to make sure that the legislation means something. The Mental Capacity Act, to my mind, is one of the misu most misused legislation in social care and health setting. And that's because I think staff don't understand it and how it applies in their setting. And I think this needs to be tailored to every, every uh, staff member to a level that they can understand it. And that's why I, I, I my mental capacity training will be di different to every different setting I'm working, depending on their experiences and their interpretation. Um, because so often people think it's just dry legislation and don't think it applies to them. But actually, legislation, when it's used well, can really be transformative to people's lives. And, you know, if only the new people plan was looking at policies, regulations and guidance is, is part of its new five topics. Oh, wait, we are. Go and complete our consultation. Now, you bring up some really great points there, Rachel. Now, I mean, you've been um, obviously uh, involved in social care. You've been involved in the NHS. You're also a supplier. This co-production angle, this this collaboration, this working togetherness. Um, what are your views on the current training situation? Yeah, I think I think that it's I, I, it's hard to disagree with a single word that's been said because I think that there, there is such wide consensus about what the issues are and what some of the areas of focus need to be going forward. It seems to me that training needs to satisfy at least four groups of stakeholder. So that training absolutely needs to work for the person receiving the training so that they feel it's of value to the work that they are undertaking. But that training also needs to satisfy the recipient of the of the care so that they feel that the things that really matter to them, which are very frequently not what care is delivered, but how that care is delivered. And from a professional um, care delivery point of view, that can be hard to hear because actually I'm not I'm not I'm prepared to forgive wrong care as long as it's delivered to me with real kindness. And we do need to be attentive to what the recipient of care really values in that exchange. But I think we also need to recognise there is the need of the employer. And there is also the need of the regulator who is acting on behalf of all of us as the general public. And I think that it, when we're thinking about training, we do have to explicitly recognise what is in it for each of those four stakeholder groups. And it's only when we work together, because it seems to me that all four of those stakeholders are in a posture of fear. You know, so the CQC, and we'll, we, we'll all have had our experience of the CQC, right? Good and bad. But the CQC is not seen, I would say, as a successful regulator. And they are in the moment really concerned about being crowded out of the ICSs as they form, right? So they're in a posture of fear. Uh, employers are in a posture of uh, fear because it's so difficult to um, make these businesses work. And if you get a requires improvement, that is absolutely, you know, that, that blows up your business, right? We all, we've all been in that place. And then I think for the individual person who, who is delivering care, the fear of getting it wrong. And as I think one of, um, one of my colleagues said, you know, the sense of which blame being allocated rather than understanding what happened rather than who did it. And that kind of sense of a restorative and just learning culture is, is widely um, attempted in the NHS, not always very successfully. So I think it's about how do we make it legitimate for each of those four groups to say, this is what we need from training. But fundamentally, it's got to work for the person who receives the care, who receives the yeah. care and the person who gives the care. Because I think that thing about actually, you know, not feeling like it's being done to you. I'm being required to go through this bloody manual handling training again, and it doesn't recognize my skills and experience that I already bring. Sorry, there's an awful lot I could say there, I'm gonna stop. 
Can, yeah, I, no. can I just come in yeah, on that? Was, because it's, it's, it's a you. very important point. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think everybody would agree here that there has to be an entry level of training. So if you are brand new to care, there has to be a standardized package of entry that gives you that consistency to, to have the basic skills to do the job. So those of us that have actually worked in care will know that you learned most of the things that you developed in your career, not in a classroom, but actually being nurtured and mentored by people that you work with. And that, that relates to most businesses. So, so technically speaking, I think we need to move to an area where there is an entry level for every care worker coming in. I don't believe that that's a care certificate. And the reason why I don't believe that that's a care certificate is because it's not monitored enough. It's you know, irrespective of whether it's CQC looking at it when they come in, they don't know what they're looking at. They're looking for a shiny certificate that any one of us can go on the Skills for Care website right now and print off. So it, it's there to actually, um, for people to actually make misuse and misrepresentation of it. The, uh, the other models within the care certificate are that they repeat themselves time over time within the different 15 standards. So you've got e-learning companies and the likes that have just basically got 15 of their courses, planted them together and said, there you go, there's a care certificate. The care certificate was designed as a competency. So learning and then competency, and then you're ready. A bit like the driving lessons before the driving tests. And that's what it was designed for, but no one actually... Um, monitors that situation closely or it's it's very much um a range of who your inspector actually is and there's no consistency so that entry level is very important how you do it is very important i think sorry. then we need to move to sorry sorry i think then we need to move to to more of a competency-based arena and 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 as has been pointed out if 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 I'm training people or sorry, if I'm working with people on the floor and they're proving that they have the skills and can show the skills, then they are competent. At that moment in time, why can I not issue a certificate for them unless there is something different that they are going to learn in the classroom of their set uh, sent there? We also need to nurture people in supervision and appraisal because the idea behind a supervision or an appraisal is for me to actually say, this is where my strengths are, this is where my weaknesses are, and training should bolt onto that part, right, okay, we can help with your development here. And there has to be a trust that comes back from the inspector to say, I'm running my business, and of course I want all my staff to be able to perform the way that they need to perform in order for that service to be successful. But trust me to do that. Let's not make it that here's a spreadsheet that I've got to complete for every member of staff to say that they've done these 14 different courses and they've done them all within the time frame that Skills for Care have set out. Um, and, and therefore, what it's doing is it's making me spend my budget doing that year on year on year instead of developing my management, instead of developing my coaches, instead of actually having the money to, to broaden my business aspect by upskilling staff to take me in a different direction. That's how most businesses would run, if you've seen it. But in care, we're handcuffed, and even the training providers are handcuffed. That quite literally, if you go to CQC and say, I want to move more to a competency model, they still want the certificate. They, so, so the training provider is still having to go out and deliver the free hour or the six hour course. And let's be honest, if I came and delivered a moving and handling course to you over three hours, and then you were let loose on the floor, is that adequate? No chance is that adequate. I should be spending three hours with you to teach you how to use a hoist properly because that's where most of the injuries come in, in relation to moving and handling. So on that basis, it is about person said I think it's an easy fix, but it needs ripping apart, restructuring, that there is an entry level, a level two, a level three, a level four. And, and just to sort of like really upset people, that is not the apprenticeship system or the or in my days, the MVQ system or the RQF, whatever name you want to give it. Because what you are doing in those systems is you're writing about stuff you've already done. You're not learning, you're reflecting. Um, and we need training to be about learning. So let's let's look at the accessibility side of things then. So we've got providers who currently have to pay the regulators to come and inspect them to tell them how bad that they're doing. We've got um, a national uh, funded, government funded initiative called Skills for Care, um, but we still have to pay for all of our mandatory training every single time someone joins our organisation. Um, so we've already hit a number of cost 
barriers we've already hit a number of paywalls how do we get the training to be accessible how do we get this entry level training where that we can move from place to place that uh, people who have got disabilities are included to make sure that the training is accessible for all demographics we don't want to end up in that uh, postcode lottery scenario but how do we make sure and i agree with you paul that has to be and it, it can't be a reflective model it has to be more of like a, a cohabitive model where we are learning constantly with the people we're supporting i remember one of roy lily's um, newsletters recently and he talks about his friend who moved into care and they had to wait for two trained staff to be able to come and take his friend to the toilet when actually if we if we lived and trained and worked with the people we're supporting and their relatives everyone should have that ability to take someone to the toilet to make access to care that much easier but how do we get to that access of training moving forwards rachel i want to come to you first how do we get training to be more accessible now how do you make it more accessible um, well, I think there's a number of things that we need to be aware of. People learn in different ways. So that's one thing to really point out. So one, one way of training doesn't fit everybody. But also a lot of the training that we see are not accessible for, in other areas. So we you tend to use a lot of jargon in our training and we need to go, move away from jargon. And particularly for people with learning disabilities, we, could, we need to move away from that. Um, also for sensory life, like myself, having captions, uh, making sure that it's face-to-face -face or online, but actually being able to see the person rather than seeing the webinar where I just see a tiny little box of the person and not being able to follow. So making it accessible for in that way as well is important. Uh, but also, most, most importantly, you need to really ask what they want to get out of the training because then you can tailor it to make it accessible to that individual. Um, because every training I do is different because I will base it on the experiences and the, the, the needs of those individuals. And as I said to you before, we need to make sure that the, the, the ultimate customer's needs are being met as well, because so often we don't hear their voices. And I hear from, from the residents, oh, this is what I want my, my, the, my support staff to know. Um, and that's the sort of thing we need to pick up a bit more to make it more relevant and accessible. So we bring real examples and bring it alive. Uh, for individuals because so often training it doesn't seem to be relevant and so unless you bring the stories of how the, the impact of your training then people were more likely to re remember for a start and also be receptive to the training because once people people shouldn't be forced to train but actually if they they enjoy it and they understand why they're there they're going to be that that will help in terms of access as well so so, yeah, no, I, I completely agree and I completely understand all of that. Um, I'm thinking now that we're looking at what's currently going on in the outstanding practice of, of training within social care. We want this to be able to inform the future. Sue, what, what's going on? What do you do within your company that's, that's different? And, and how do you think we can make this this entry-level training more accessible? The skill, we, I mean... I don't want everyone to put their hands up, but do put your hands up if you think that the Skills for Care care certificate is not fit for purpose. I expect everyone to put their hands up probably on this. Um, I've not had great experiences with it myself. So what are the options, Sue? How do we how do we change this? You know, and again, I go back to it, it has to start with the, the business owner and, and the business, you know, it's just having that top down culture rather than the bottom up processes that are currently part of that uh, mandatory training. And, you know, certainly we did at, at Home Instead, we did a, a massive project on this, you know, in terms of how do we actually create a great process for everybody that's coming through the training. And it was the things that we that we put in place was Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It was making sure that all learning styles were create, create, um, catered for. So we did a lot on Honey and Mumford. We actually did um, coaching sessions. So how do so teaching people how to coach throughout their you know in terms of mentors. That's what we did. We 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 recorded conversations in terms of what the experience was was like. So it's, it's all of these things, but it's also monitoring it as you go. So is it is it actually delivering what you need it to and, and assessing it at each time? Because if it isn't, then it needs to change. So it, it's, it's having that sense of really understanding what you're trying to achieve, what the objective is, making sure that you're catering for people, but also making sure that people feel 
like they're achieving something. And I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs for me is probably the easiest way of looking at that because you, you're looking at all base needs as well as um, you know, self-esteem and self-actualization. Thank you, Sue. John, CEO of the IHSCM, fresh off delivering um, uh, High Performance Leadership Framework this morning. Please come in. I just think we're in a, we're in a great place here. We're, we're, we've got all of these expert opinions, lived testimonies, lived experiences. We know exactly what's wrong. More importantly, we all know how to fix it. If you were given carte blanche to redesign this, and make it fit for purpose, this group and the audience that you've got today could absolutely do it. There is nothing stopping us from taking that opportunity and including it as part of the next people plan or even creating our own, this is our new proposal for delivery of, of training in social care. And I just urge this group, you know, you'll, you'll get every piece of support from the Institute we can manage with it, my suggestion is take this opportunity, be bold, let's write our own. This is how to do social care training. We bring all of your expertises together and we present it and say the current methodology has to stop. This is how it needs to be redesigned and do it like that. So like you knew what our final talking point of today was, you know, what should the future of social care training look like? Uh, we, <laughs> we will come on to that. So I think it's a great idea and I well, think it's a natural it. evolution. Yeah, exactly. You, it's a natural evolution. It. Yeah, natural evolution of um, the people plan. Um, Caroline, um, you're obviously going to be um, helping me into understanding the world of um, uh, easy reads and trying to make some of our work more accessible. What are the options for us to make training more accessible? And what's your opinion on how, I, I'm not saying we should tear skills for care down. I'm not saying we should tell the government not to do things. How do we suggest to work with them better? And what can we do with them that makes their training more accessible and useful? Well, so first of all, I always think that we still need to spell out more. And I think that's really linking on to what Sue just said. We need to spell out what accessibility means to the people that training needs to be accessible for and who we are training for. And I think it's key to talk to people, to keep on talking to people, to testing things out, um, to having, I mean, me as the researcher I am, I try and develop my humility all the time by testing and failing and testing and failing and trying to talk to as many people as possible who have got all these different experiences of, you know, living with with disabilities, um, having trained people, having worked with different people. Um, and that's also Dudley Sawyer just said it in, um, in a, one of the, his comments, we need to talk to the people who are actually receiving the care. So I think spelling out accessibility after we've spoken more to people what it means to them, I think that's really key. And I wonder whether this is something as a group and the people plan can really achieve is to, you know, boil it all down into a sentence of what we're trying to achieve. And I think, well, I am seeing, and I'm hoping that that will continue. I think I'm seeing within the government more of a focus now of actually involving people, of actually trying to want to listen to people in adult social care and, you know, using on the drawing on social care. And, and I would hope that if something like this, if there's a, a vision and a real, you know, people-centered, um, yeah, idea of what accessibility means that we could then also get the government on board with that and say, look, this is what we need to work towards. Yeah, no, I, I understand. And, you know, we have to give credit where credit's due. And I, we are meeting with some people from the government soon around the people plan. And it's got to be, it's, we've got to have those open arms and the willingness to work with people and not just constantly tear people down all the time. Steph, I've been involved in um, some of your discussions at my home life on, on the future of, of, well, of anything in social care. Um, and I've also been involved in your development of, of resources for a variety of people with a variety of needs. So how important is accessibility and, and what are your suggestions for us on how we get um, training available to everybody? I've been listening to people with huge interest and, and I'm not sure that there's huge amounts that I can add other than 
but there's always another that. I, I do think there's a there's a whole group of folk who somewhere in here where we also need to pay attention to with and for and and that's I mean you know I, I've got a couple of family members one of whom um, is actively involved in supporting their son and one of whom is actively involved in supporting their mum and I don't notice that they've had access to huge amounts of statutory training in order to be seen as being competent to care for them. So I do think there's something, I don't, I don't know if it's accessibility, I'm just thinking about, you know, accessibility, if anything, I guess, is about supporting everybody to be able to get hold of something. And there is something in there for me about where unpaid carers fit in our discussion. Yes. I think there's absolutely going back to what Rachel said about um, really listening to the person. And I guess we've all been involved in social care in different ways, one way or another for a long time. And I guess one of the things that most people would say is that um, I'm capable of telling you however I'm telling you, and it might not be verbally, whether something's working for me or not. And I do really want to be matched with a person who connects with me, but I also do want that person to understand actually what my learning disability means and how it actually reflects in my behavior or the fact that it's not okay for me to be constantly eating chalk. I do actually, need somebody to be skilled enough to understand what's happening whether I've got a urinary tract infection or whether actually nobody's noticed the fact that I've been starting to struggle with dementia and I'm using the word struggle because for a lot of people it is although I know for some people it's it's not a positive word and I come back to all of this takes time and one of the things that we rarely have within the world of social care, particularly at the moment, is enough people and enough funding to create the time to really listen to people and understand how we ensure their training is accessible and that we're reflecting the training that people need us to have. Not a very sophisticated answer, but... I well, but you bring up a really good point about time, Steph, and I think this is something that we need to consider because, yes, I know we're sat talking today, but I'm hoping by the end of it we've got some really good ideas that we can take and try and draft into something practicable. But there's so much conversation that goes on and it is the same old same old and you know i i led each conversation about the people plan at the helpless care show going you know please don't worry this isn't the same conversation you've always heard yes some of the uh the the, the foundations of it are the same but what we're doing is different we're not going to then continue talking about this for the next three years we're going to invest and we're going to we're going to work forwards and we're going to be a doer in, instead of instead of it just being that constant conversation mindy i want to come to you and i want to throw funding at you as well just in case you've got anything to add on there this. but the, the 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 barriers to to training the barriers to access to training are obviously a great and varied funding is an issue and with that comes locale and we've also got CQ, uh, skills for care endorsed providers but then we also know that these endorsed providers then outsource their training so the training providers who are outsourced on skills for care endorsed what Oh, lost my train of thought now. Started talking and then looked at my phone and got a text. I'm happy to jump in on funding. Thank you. Thank but you. Also, can I, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments about the previous, um, the previous topic. So one is that we're already spending a lot of time on things that are not productive and that people don't experience as helpful. So there is, there's necessarily going to be a period of double rowing while we carry on doing the non-productive things while we're creating what's productive. But I think there is an opportunity to gain some time there. I think the other thing, and I, I just think it's so important that we recognise it, is that the vast majority of care is undertaken by people who don't even see themselves as carers, who just see the, the, the things that they do as part of the relationship with their mum or their son or that, you know, so I think it's really, when we're talking about um, accessibility to 
to training is about how do we support people who are taking the majority of the care work. And I think it's very important we don't lose sight of that. And, and it goes back to, I think Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, I think it's a brilliant thing to refer to because for, for carers who are caring at home, unpaid carers, the first thing they think of is not that they need training, you know, but it, it would help in all sorts of ways, including in the sort of prevention agenda, which, you know, most people want to spend more of their, their life and time at home. So I think it's really important to decide that. On funding, I think that the, I think that we do need to move to accredit um, training providers, because I think that that is a gap. And I think that there are some really excellent providers, but how do you know? Um, and I think that's a very important step. I think that we have got to face um, the fact that we're, we're already spending a lot of money on training, you know, through, through different um, buckets of funding. And that actually there's a lot of inefficiency about that spend. And I think there is a real requirement to do, as I think one of the, our colleagues earlier said, to actually create a core training, to make it uh, mandatory, to standardise it and to fully fund it. There will be training pathways, specialist pathways and development pathways, which are absolutely what we should be doing. But for that core bit, uh, I think we have to fully fund it. And that will be a challenge in this in this environment, but it is the way that we need to go. And I think it is about recognising that the money is already being spent. You know, skills care is, um, you know, is is luxuriously funded for what for, for, I think. 37 million, let's not be coy. 37 million from the <laughs> no, last time I checked. Enough. You know, and it is a, a northward perhaps, but you know, and 37 million is a drop in the ocean of what's required, right? But but if we add up all of those pockets of money, including what is being spent by providers themselves, I think that where we go to is that there has to be um, fully funded, a fully funded core mandatory training set. And I bet you if they fully fund core mandatory training, training passports would, would happen overnight. They'd be going, oh no, it's fine. You don't have to do your mandatory training again because we're now paying for it. But if they can do right, it in Wales with manual handling training, they've done exactly. it. Exactly. You know, the path has been trodden. Right. We're, we're close to time on this. Now, I really want to get from each of you now what the future of training needs to be. So some really good high suggestions of, of what we can do. Um, not, you know, stuff that's average. What we can do as a group in a plan, the recommendations we can make on top of the people plan and um, for the future of training. I just want to draw some attention to some of the comments in the in the chat. I, I know Margaret um, Travis is in there and she was saying that she wants parents to be involved in the training for uh, the care homes where their, where their children are. And I think inclusion of the people receiving care and those relatives is essential now moving forward. It's it's my sort of vendetta this year, next year, to make sure co-production with those using care is at all times. And I think if we're going to discuss the future of training, that needs to, to come into play. So I'm going to give you all about, I know it's not long, about a minute, just to give some ideas of what the future with training is going to be. And Paul's already unmuted, so he's volunteered to go first. <laughs> Um, I think bonding it is very difficult across the piece because there's such a variety of different training. So I think you create an entry level training, which everybody that works in care, be it unpaid carers or paid carers, has access to. Um, and that is funded by the government. That gives you your starting point, And we know that every single person involved is gone through the same process to get to that level. Then it's down to the businesses and pathways as to where they're going and how they're going to develop their team or an individual uh, member of staff. But, but that's so important. There was a second point that I was thinking of, Adam. Um, oh, yeah. We have to move to a level where accreditation is, is there for training organisations. And I, I'm someone, even as a training organisation, I would throw Ofsted in there. I know there are schools, but schools are education. CQC and not education, so why not bring someone of that degree in to do inspections on your training? There's my Thank there's my thoughts. I, I'm Palvi and Jazz are frantically and Joan are frantically tracking all this information, ready for the next people plan, potentially a training plan that we're going to produce. Anyone, if you've got any comments in the audience, please shove them in the chat. I don't know whether we're going to get time to come and ask um, or bring them up um, verbally, but put them in the chat and Jazz, Palvi and Joan will pounce on them and get them um, uh, recorded. Sue. Um, I'm just thinking that, yeah, and I put this in the chat earlier, is almost that 
if, if businesses could do their own risk assessment as to what the training needs are, then that would be a top down approach rather than this, you know, everybody has to do everything. So what, what is the, the risk assessment? What, what risk assessment have they done? And at that point, that should inform the training that goes on. So that because it's very different from a care home to a, a home care business to people with learning disabilities, as you rightly said, Steph, it's very different for learning disabilities to people with head injuries. So how, if, for me, it would be much better if if care businesses could do a risk assessment first and that would inform the training. Simplify it. So I would, I would agree if they, the prioritisation of training needs to be down to the individual managers or the home or, or whoever's in charge and prioritise based on the staff skills and the, and the, the support that they're, they're required. Uh, but I would like the voices of people who've been supported to be, be heard more. So I would like to see more lived in experience training. So, for example, the deaf awareness training everyone is more powerful because I have a, a hearing loss. But I'm working with, with people who are blind at the moment and they are delivering their experiences. And we learn so much when we listen to others. Um, but at the moment, it's when you just say it, it's theoretical training, whereas actually if you have lived in experience, it becomes more meaningful, more powerful to those individuals who, who attend the training. I, 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 you know, I wholeheartedly agree with you, Rachel. If we were to, and I'll use LGBTQIA as an example, because obviously I'm from that community. If I was in an organisation that was run by straight cisgendered people, I wouldn't expect them to create an inclusion policy around LGBT people without including me, because they want to be able to include the people within the organisation who it actually matters to, so they can learn from them. And I think if we're going to do training, we need to learn from the people who we're actually training to support and training about. And prioritisation, I remember getting chastised by my CCG as it was um, back then a number of times because I prioritised things like stoma training over prevent training and I kept being told I was failing my safeguarding audit because we hadn't done prevent training a predominantly white farming um, culture where we were and we were being chastised because we'd put the health and care needs of the people we were supporting over a government initiative for their failure of actions of supporting and protecting the country that's just my rant on that Caroline yeah if we think about practical steps forward, I want to go back to the accessibility issue. And I really do think that we need to spell out a definition of what accessibility means exactly. Does it mean to people that they'll start the training, that they'll enjoy the training, that they'll actually finish it, you know, that they'll actually be able to put it into practice? What does it actually mean? And I think um, there's lots of good work going on out there. So finding good practice examples, and you've started doing that in the people plan. Um, and building on that. So, you know, what are we, what, what's being done well and what can we do more of? I think that's practical steps that could be taken immediately and could have a, a, a good outcome in the short term. Yeah. What I'm hearing here is we need a new social care innovators group specifically around training in social care. And I think the first mission we've got is defining accessibility. And I think that's something we could actually achieve together is defining what we mean about accessibility and training and then creating practical plans moving forwards for providers um, and working with those powers that be that need their sign off on things to, to get it all approved. I'm getting quite excited now. I am getting quite excited. Steph? I think there's just a couple of other things for us to consider maybe. One is, is the future of training spending a bit of time with the other? Um, and I guess what I mean by that is, um, you know, if I go back to my days as an OT, I genuinely believed my perspective was better about than the nurses, than the doctors, than the whoever's. Um, and there is something about really celebrating what social care is about, but recognising and learning from other parts of the system, including the NHS. Whether that's training or whether that's learning. And again, what do we actually mean by training? And, and I can't not say this, can I, given... I guess what we're about at my home life England but we've all I think been referring to it in different ways which is actually the impact of the training is really connected to the support and leadership within a team so folk can go off and do fab training but actually if they're not given the opportunity to practice learn test out be supported by a confident leader who wants to learn their interest in new ideas and their innovation. And I do think that a lot of folk find themselves in positions of leadership within social care by default, 
they're often you know the per, they started off as a care assistant and end up as the registered manager what i'm not saying we need it's not about the registered manager or the care certificate there is something essential about supporting people post getting that label to really understand what leadership means for them and then how they can get the best out of the training and the support that they're offering to people and i just think it's a gap in terms of standardized approaches for training within social care it really comes into succession planning as soon as someone enters your organization and cpd and learning plans and understanding continual professional development john i will bring you in quickly but then i need to go to mindy yeah, i just want to say look take this opportunity it's very rare in any organization in any sector that all of a sudden you've developed a bit of momentum you've gathered really capable and competent and experienced people together and you've all got a will to change take this opportunity write a new blueprint create it and uh i'm i'm sure that we'll get it listened to and we'll get it adopted we are just going to believe in ourselves here thank you Thank you, John. And no, we will we will be on this. Mindy, um, you have the last say on what the future of training should look like. I love like. that, my favourite. <laughs> so I think three, I think everything that everyone has said absolutely, you know, fully endorse. Three things that I would draw out, and um, a couple of them build on what Paul has already said. I think accreditation of training providers is absolutely essential. I think um, the basic entry qualification that Paul described is a really good place to begin. But I think that that needs to be developed with those four stakeholders, with the person re receiving the training, with the person receiving the care, with um, employers and with regulators. I think it's very important that we that we build in their requirements at the very, very beginning. I think the third thing I'd say, and I really want to um, thank Dudley, um, Dudley Sawyer, who put it this in the chat, and I really, really couldn't agree more is that there is something about, you know, what are we trying to get to in the end? We're trying to get to in the end that people who have um, needs to live well, receive the care and the support that they need when they need it in a way that really makes sense and is valuable to them. That's what we're trying to get to, right? And paid care does some of that, but un unpaid care does an awful lot of that. And I think there is an opportunity to teach um, uh, the kind of giving but also the receiving of care which requires an awful lot of grace right the giving and the receiving of care to our children when they're in school so that it becomes part of the essential life skills that we understand that we need so I think those would be the three things accreditation basic uh, skills but with our four stakeholders and teaching these skills to give and receive care at school Look, well, honestly, thank you all so much for joining us today. It has been um, a really interesting and inspiring conversation. I do think there's plenty more work for us to be doing now. Whoever thinks uh, that we're not going to do much and we're going to get bored in our in our days, especially over the summer, we can't all be in Spain and, and watching football and sitting by the pool drinking sangria, as Paul. Um, but I think we have got the opportunity, like John says, to take this momentum and, and carry it forwards now and and really create something special and something new. So I will work with people from the People Plan Group, people who've been on this panel. If anyone is interested in joining a group to set up a proper training plan and a new vision for training moving forwards, a blueprint, if you will, like John says, um, please do get in touch with us. Um, we have got the consultation, which is currently open for the People Plan. Um, there is a much heavier focus on making sure we capture all the views of people, not just the workforce this time around. So that lived experience angle, people who are currently using care, relatives of people, but also from commissioners, stakeholders, from health, uh, basically from anyone in the community who wants to see a real change in care. So please do lend your views to that consultation. It's running to the 15th of September and you might win a voucher. Um, you never know um, if you if you do complete it. Um, many ways in which you can upload that information. Our next roundtable will be on, I'm hoping Palvi knows. Can I unmute Palvi? Hi, yes, sorry, it's on Thursday, June 23rd, and we will be doing recruitment at 12 to 1.
Thursday, June 23rd, recruitment 12 till 1. Um, so until then, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for this roundtable today. Don't go away because we have got the rest of the Learning Festival on at this moment in time. Um, do come and join me on stage two. At, uh, I'm going to say quarter past one, I think it is, ten past one, um, where we are going to be um, learning around uh, LGBT uh, understand the needs of L sorry older LGBT people, 10 past one on stage two. So if you haven't got links, quickly email Jade now. I'm sure she can send them out. Um, or you have got stage one um, chaired by the fabulous John, but who does want to join me on stage two? Stage two is going to be fantastic. I'm, I'm battling for the audience now. So um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you for giving up your lunch with us today and um, keep your eyes peeled moving forward and get your votes and your views in on that consultation. Um, have a good day, everyone. Take care.